Hello, wonderful. This is Sarah, and I'm here with Andrew Bauman, and he is the co-founder and director of the Christian Counseling Center for Sexual Health and Trauma. He's a licensed mental health counselor with a Master of Arts in Counseling Psychology from the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. Blah, blah, blah. That's like a lot of words, right? Like a, like a lot of ologies. So like, right. you're like the man with the ologies. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> And you're also an author of yes. Floating Away, Stumbling Toward Wholeness, uh, The Psychology of Porn, and you work with Christy on A Brave Lament, right? That's right. Yep. My wife, Christy. Christy. Tell us who Christy is. Yes. My wife, Christy, of 12 years. She's Aww. an author and a therapist as well. And so we do this work together, working with couples, working with all sorts of people. So I, yeah, we, we make a really good, a good team. Oh, I love that. I love that. Uh, my husband works with me, but it's all in like the business side of things, right. you know, not, the, right. not the, uh, the people side. I'm the people person and he's like all the other good stuff there you go. <laughs> that, exactly. that makes life happen. Okay. Yeah. So Andrew, ah, sometimes men change. Sometimes they don't change. And sometimes women change. Sometimes they don't change. Yes. Like how do we figure all this out. Yeah. Well, most, yeah, most, most men, especially those who are struggling with kind of narcissism abuse or sexually um, unwanted behaviors, Mm -hmm. it's incredibly difficult to change. I mean, it just Mm -hmm. is. I'm reminded of, um, you know, when Jesus asks the question, do you want to get well to Mm -hmm. the, to the person at the well? And it's like that question, like, do you actually want to get well? Because it's going to cost you something. Um, Mm -hmm. And for men, it's, it's a long road back to dealing with our woundedness, to dealing with our deep insecurities, to dealing with our innate misogyny and hatred against mm-hmm. women, um, undoing um, patriarchal structures that have served us, um, undo- undoing our own sexual stories, our own sexual trauma. And it's hard work that few men have the courage to do. There were like 14 points that I wanted to make. <laughs> from that so let's start if we may with uh may i simplify it and and just kind of call something self selfishness would that be okay and women can be selfish too but i i I like to kind of make it as simple as possible and it's like hey if you've gotten away with being selfish in a relationship for 10 years and then someone's saying hey don't be selfish anymore that's why do you feel like that's so probably sounds like a silly question, but why do you feel like that is so tough to change? Yeah. Well, I think there's this, this innate um, entitlement that so many men have, Mm -hmm. you know, I think of my own story and being addicted to pornography for 13 years. um, And then what that kind of did to me when I came to relationship is I almost felt entitled, right? Mm -hmm. I almost felt entitled to sexual, you know, acts. I almost felt entitled to be served because pornography had taught me that 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 was the thing. I am there to get served. I am there to get pleasure. And you are to bring that to me. There's no mutuality in that. It's completely selfish. There's no shared sexuality. It's completely, I get my needs met and you're the one to do it. You are an object, right? So then that makes violence against women much more easily accessible when you have that fundamental framework and that pornographic mindset that women are objects and women are here to serve. So I've done some work. I I was in a pageant, right? And I've had a lot of clients who are, I was in a pageant like last year, like Mm. first one, like that's not like a historic thing in my life that I've like done, but I did. It was in COVID. I was trying to lead by example, doing something scary and Mm. really came from the concept of, pageant girls mm. as objects rather than people because mm. they're like the epitome of that right yeah. i mean yeah. obviously to be watched, to be well, yeah you know you are an object you stand here you make me look good you serve me because that mentality is at home in porn but it's not just in the bedroom right like that yeah. comes yeah. everywhere Yeah. And I think, uh, I mean, even in the theology that I grew up in, it's in the theology that I grew up in, you know, it's no women can't speak. Women can't lead men. Women. It's this subtle sexism that is actually Mm -hmm. embedded in a lot Mm -hmm. of, in a lot of our culture. Um, 
you know, both just American culture and Christian culture that mm -hmm. is so easily turned into abuse. So this is a funny story. So I was in my past, uh, very conservative culture mm -hmm. and conservative religiously, not, I guess, politically too, but in the context of the conversation right now, that word has like a different, even a different force that it did yeah. two years ago when you would have said conservative. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, within that process, I remember being at an event and my job was to pass out the papers. Mm. And here I already had a master's degree. You know, since then I've got a best-selling book, top ranked podcast, blah, 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 blah. And my job was to pass out the papers. Wow. Yes. You know, and I remember yeah. thinking like, I feel like something might be wrong here. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, is that the best I can do is passing out the papers? Jeez. And um, what a disservice to the world when we are silencing our women in that way. Exactly, exactly. And knowing that most likely you should have been up there speaking, right? You should have been up there yeah. teaching. You should have been up there leading. And yet how many men have not dealt with their own insecurity that they mm -hmm. could not... Um, they could not see a woman lead in a sense because they're that insecure. Um, and mm -hmm. I remember I was a pastor before I was a therapist um, in Southern Baptist church. And I remember one of my, um, my pastor buddy, uh, he had just met my girlfriend, Christy, who became my, later became my wife. And he said, do you really want uh, like a woman like that? She was finishing up her master's degree, wanted to go get her doctorate. Don't you? And he said this, he said, don't you want someone that will support your ministry? Yeah. Um, right. Don't you need someone a little bit more of a helpmate? And I was just like, I still remember that even though that was 15 years ago, you know, I was like, wait a minute, why does she have to be small? Yeah. So that I can be big. Why mm -hmm. does, why does, she, why does my insecurity have to hold her back? Mm -hmm. I mean, my mm -hmm. wife is a powerhouse. If you meet her, she, but guess what? So am I. And us together, make a dynamite pair and I need her to step into her glory and she mm -hmm. needs me to step into my glory and we can inspire each other's glory rather than mm -hmm. having this scarcity mindset that somehow she has to be less so that I could be. Uh -huh. Well, and so my husband was on an interview and people said, Oh, how do you deal with Sarah's success? And I was like, well, he has his own. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. He's got his own thing going on. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not what I do. It's not always on camera or whatever, but right. he's, incredibly successful yeah. in what he does and right. you know and I'm is successful in what I do and it's it is just that pairing exactly. where it's like cool you do you here I'm doing me sometimes I do things together sometimes I do things apart exactly exactly it's pretty that's, easy yeah that's such a, a big thing in a healthy relationship is how do mm -hmm. we we share right we we're a team mm -hmm. we do this together mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to look the exact same you know, mm -hmm. but my wife leads me in areas and I lead her in areas um, that mm -hmm. I'm better at. And she leads me in areas. She's like, we work together as a team. I call it taking turns. There you go. Exactly. You're able to take turns. Exactly. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I love that. So let's talk about the listener who's hoping their, their guy, their girl, like, you know, you're from a guy's perspective, but uh, the interview I did just before this was had a lot of toxic women conversations and it definitely mm -hmm. can be both though. They yes. show up differently. Yes. They, they tend to show up very differently. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say someone's saying, Oh, I'm going to change baby. Oh, it's going to be different this time. Oh, you know, things are going to be different. Right. Uh, how do we know if they're telling the truth or not? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. The way that I counsel, the way, like, will your husband enter crucifixion? Will he die? Mm -hmm. Will he die? Will he suffer? Will he bleed? Eventually, we'll step into resurrection, but he can't step into resurrection until he stepped into crucifixion. And so mm -hmm. he has to be able to suffer. Like, will he do his own work? And it doesn't just mean calling up a therapist and having one session. No, it means... <laughs> It literally means reading the books, going to groups. Now, what if you call a therapist and then learn new words and then go home and tell your <laughs> wife and you abuse her with the words exactly. that you learned? Exactly. In therapy? That happens all the time and it's ridiculous. That's yeah. not death. That's actually just using your power and your control in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. That's not suffering. Suffering actually costs you something. And so look for signs of suffering. Like, 
And it's not just this fake repentance either, where it's manipulative, where I'm weeping to get your, to try to win you back to get that honeymoon stage. No, it's a different way of life. It's Mm -hmm. a different way of life. Um, You know, it starts with providing safety, you know, providing safety to your betrayed partner. Then um, this is from um, Tom Pride. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Let's talk about what safety means, right? Because um, I assume you mean uh, an emotionally safe place for her to be upset about past behavior. Boom. Yep. Yep. Well, she can actually rage. She can actually begin to, to tell the truth. Which is yes. what was it like for to be lied to for so many years? What was it like to be gaslighted for so long? And you mm-hmm. can begin to handle it without mm-hmm. you becoming aggressive, without you, like, you don't have to be insecure. You're right. I have failed you time mm-hmm. and time again. And there's mm-hmm. no words I can say to make that better. The only thing I can do is to live differently from this moment on. And that's mm-hmm. what I'm going to do, right? Like, there's mm-hmm. nothing I can do except continuing to provide that emotional safety. And this is from Tom Pride in uh, Psalms 82 initiative. Um, And he talks about the three stages, um, safety, stability, and then strength. And so the betrayed partner first has to have that safety. And so how can you begin to provide that safety? Um, Then it's the stability. So that's the long period of time that, that you become a trustworthy man. No, no more lies, no more aggression, um, you know, you're just, you're living authentically and you're living truthfully over a long period of time. Mm-hmm. After that, then the woman can step into her strength. Then she can forgive. Then she can begin to move on after the safety and stability. Okay, has Andrew, so are you telling me <laughs> that something's wrong? If you go into that first counseling session and someone says to her, someone who's been abused for several years, hey, the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Mm -hmm. If you're not ready to drop everything that just got, whatever's happened the last 15 years that you finally got brave enough to confront, Mm -hmm. you're not ready to drop all that and let it go, let it go, (laughs) right? Then you're not really a Christian. You need to doubt your salvation. So I'm going to lean into my microphone here. (laughs) Run, run, run the other way if you get that counsel which is all too familiar you have to run because that is literally the opposite of what needs to happen forgiveness yes that's vital but that's way later down the stage that's way later that's after the safety has been established that's after stability has been established do not offer cheap forgiveness because Mm -hmm. that's it comes without a cost and Mm -hmm. authentic forgiveness there's a cost there's a bloodshed um, mm-hmm. there's a crucifixion. And, mm-hmm. and again, men change. I work with men on the front lines every single day. Men do change, but it's incredibly rare. It's incredibly mm-hmm. rare. Men have to choose to be either a fool or a coward. That's it. And most men are cowards. And I would much rather have uh, a foolish man than a cowardly man. And so mm-hmm. will you choose a man who's willing to, to, to deal with his own pain, even if it looks foolish? weep deal with his issues go against toxic masculinity where at least he's no longer a coward at least he's willing to suffer and die for for an authentic way of being for genuine intimacy rather than a fake intimacy Mm, i love it so it looks to kind of tie all that up with a bow so what it looks like is i'm sorry things will be different and then things actually are. Yeah. And I, and I even tell people to stop apologizing. Like I see so many men who are like, right. I've apologized a hundred times. It's just like, I don't care about your apologies. Like mm-hmm. it literally say it once and mm-hmm. then live differently. Yeah. Live with a posture of humility, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Posture of humility. Owning your- and I, I kind of joked, I think with Lundy Bancroft, it was like, I, I said, <laughs> okay, so you're saying... How do you know if they're actually going to change? Yeah. They do, right? You know, and we make it so complicated. Like, well, right. you know, he's still flipping everything on me and still blaming me for everything. And then using, he says he's going to go to therapy, but then he turns the therapy to say, well, what are you going to do differently? How are you going to change? How exactly. are you going to be more respectful? Do you think that's really changing? But he's going to therapy. Gross, and not at all. Yep. We become addicted to that hope. Right. Exactly. Because- 
them not changing is so painful, whether it involves family members, kids, whatever else, we become addicted to that hope. And because uh, we don't want to start over. We don't want to admit our own foolishness. I'm going to, you said like, you know, I got fooled by him. Right. And the the, the thing is, is that no matter what, both people are going to have to do their own work. It's just going to look really different. It's just going to look really different. But the betrayed women um, who are being continuously gaslighted, like, yeah, you will be called to your own work. And it sucks yeah. because you're also the victim. And yet you do have to do your own self-respect, your own self-reflection of what led me here. What And can you do that with kindness rather than yeah. contempt that somehow, you know, you're terrible. You're this, like, no, <laughs> like you can be kind um, to how you got there. Um, mm-hmm. And you can begin to radically love yourself well, where you don't get in that type of relationship again. Mm. So I, th- I see a lot of women willing to do the work, but they work on the wrong things. Yeah. Like they want to be more, more, more right. forgiving, right. more of the things that they're already good at yep. versus better at spotting wolves better at saying no to two people, not just saying no. And like, I'm not going to go out to dinner with you or (laughs) no, I can't, don't have time for that today. But like, no, you cannot be my life anymore. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the the same is true. Like it's going to hurt. If you're doing authentic work, it's going to hurt. You got to grieve. You got to grieve, grieve, grieve. You got to wail. Like you've lost so much life. Um, Like, it's going to cost you something as well. So the same, you know, is true for men. It's just, it's different. It's a different work. It's a different grief. Um, Mm -hmm. But the journey is actually fairly similar. Well, this is kind of funny. I'd love to know your opinion on it. Because someone was talking to me recently and they were like talking about the work and they were in couples therapy and it was going really badly, you know? And uh, I was like, I don't even know if it's that much work. And I'm being kind of, you know, Mm -hmm. Stick with it here. I don't know if it's that much. I don't even know if it's that much worth. All he has to do is be as nice to you as he pretends to be. Uh, There you go. Right. Right. Because they're very capable of appearing nice and kind and loving and giving and godly when someone's watching. There you go. Exactly. But really, is that not kind of a unique point? It's like they act like they don't know what to do, but obviously they do know what to do because if someone was watching, they would be able to do it. Exactly. Yep. And, and men are much more, you know, especially narcissistic abusive men are much more capable than we think they are. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Get into the mic again, Andrew. Get into the mic again. There you go. Say Lean it. on in. Right. <laughs> we, we treat them so much like adolescent boys yes. because they actually act like adolescent boys. Yeah. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. So it's like, yeah, that's what you know, pornography addiction is all about is wait, they're living out of this abused little boy. But the way to help them is not to treat them and, you know, like continue that. It, it's actually, no, to call them to more, to say, no, like, I'm not going to allow this. I am going to live like an adult. Like, I'm not going to stoop down. And so many women, because of their own brokenness, because of their own longing, you know, in a sense, say, yeah, I got to, to get the love I need, I need to cater to his 12-year-old you know, adolescent self and cater to that. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Actually, can you expect more? Men mm-hmm. don't need to be catered to. We're not children. And yet we need to heal our wounds that, that cause us to act like children. Yeah. And I like coddling, right? Because if you are a caregiving personality, And you want to get better at being more caring. Like when women go to therapy, right? Like that's like the work they want to do. Well, how do I become more caring to meet more of his needs? How do I become less selfish? How do I die to self? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So that he can take up more space in the relationship. And the work is for him to take less space, like a lot less. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I would encourage your listeners to my wife wrote an article called the coddling of the American husband. Mm -hmm. Um, Like that is so true. We actually, you lean into the wrong thing, right? It's actually, will you lean into what makes you feel more uncomfortable? Like your work is actually learning to take up space. Like your work is actually 
becoming equals with your husband rather than just trying to continuing to mother him, continuing mm-hmm. to serve your own brokenness in that way. And we end up broken people that we ended up using each other, right? For our own, our own un, unaddressed wounds. I'm going to ask you a really hard question. All right. What advice would you give to mothers mm-hmm. about their sons? Mm. In what regard? And I see a lot of, especially if there's been a divorce or you've, you know, there's been pain in a romantic relationship. And then it's like, oh, but, you know, it's socially appropriate in many ways to make it all about the kids after that. Yes. Right. It's like your life is all about the kids. Right. And then we're, I mean, I'm just going to say it straight. Then we're really confused while we have selfish kids. Yeah. It's like, you know, I think we think the less selfish we are in regards to our kids, right. the less selfish they will be. But some personality types are just more inclined yeah. to learn that everything's about them. And then they it recreate is. and perpetuate this as adults. Yeah, right. And so many times they watch their own, if they have a narcissistic father, they watch their own father, they watch their own, you know, they're all watching. And so how do you, and they're taking in, what is masculinity? What is femininity? And so I encourage, especially mothers, like how do you just begin to have real conversations, continuing authentic conversations around Mm -hmm. what is healthy masculinity? Mm -hmm. What is toxic masculinity? What is femininity? What is, what is healthy sexuality? You know, Mm -hmm. talking about sexuality openly, right? Mm -hmm. If your kids are younger, you know, talking about their bodies, like you're just, you're always, you don't do one sex talk. You have a thousand, (laughs) you have thousands of them all the time for one minute at a time. You know, we're always Mm -hmm. talking to our young kids about their bodies and yep, there's a penis vagina. Keep your hands to yourself. You're just normalizing bodies, normalizing that. And so then it makes those conversations later in the game, less awkward, right? Interesting. When you're just normalizing this. Yeah, we're going to talk about this. We're going to, oh, yeah. what about, and you know, my kid, my older son, eight-year-old loves Mario, you know, and he's, I was just, re- I didn't realize till much later, like, wait, they're always saving the poor damsel in distress. Can we just talk about that? You know, to my young boy, like, well, why do you think princess is always needs to be saved? Like, what does that say? Well, can princess be the hero? Yeah, well, princess can definitely be the, you know, and we talk about instead of that whole sexist, unconsciously sexist thing in video games and culture that a woman needs to be rescued by the man. It's like, no, I'm having these conversations all the time because I don't want my kid to grow up and be a little sexist. And I feel like the other, cause I've heard some people and they say things like, oh, I think toxic relationships are on the, gonna be on the decline because Disney movies are now showing princesses saving themselves. <laughs> and I'm like, eh, and we have iGen, okay. right? So we have kids with less practice yes. having to accommodate other people's needs, like in a enormous, like the, that Malcolm Gladwell book where it's like, they talk about 10,000 hours, like to become right. an expert in something, you have to be 10,000 hours. Yeah. You and I growing up, for the most part, had 10,000 hours of having to be unselfish naturally built in. Yes, right, right. We had to listen to the music our parents wanted on the radio station. We had to share a TV with people in our family. You know, like we didn't have Netflix accommodated to you may also like, right? Right. And that is not being built in like at all into this next generation. That's a good point. Yes, exactly. So what are we going to do to begin to to address that. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and being, <laughs> I hate to say awareness because that is like, mm-hmm. I hate when people just like, let's, you know, awareness, domestic violence, awareness. Oh, well, did no one realize that was a problem? <laughs> like, right. Right. Do we really need like to wear purple to recognize that you shouldn't hit your wife? Like, I didn't realize that was like a, you know, right. we're confused about that. Right. Um, so I hate to say awareness, but, you know, being aware, like my mother probably hardly ever said, what do you want for dinner? Mm, yeah. And yeah. now we do with our kids and, and to be more aware as parents to say, you eat what I want. Right. You do what I want. I'm mama's taking a nap. Yeah. Exactly. Not, not all the time, but teaching right. them someone else. Right. Your own desires are important, right? Your own self-care rather than mm-hmm. I'm not, the world does not revolve around you. I love you. Yes. Yes. 
I am tired and you're yes. going to be in your room and you're going to clean your room and I'm going to go lay down. Like you're yes. going to be human with them. And so- yeah, I, Yes, yeah. yes. Because then when they get into a relationship and their wife says, she's tired, it's like, yeah. what? My mom was never tired. She always had my stuff ready and had this and was my servant. Right. And, and, and in Christian teaching, we want to be servants yes. without creating selfish. Yeah, exactly. It's tricky, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I see, again, so many men that I work with, we do so much work around their relationship with their mothers because it comes out so much in sexual brokenness. It comes out so much. Dude, tell me that is not my area of expertise at all. So yeah, tell me how that shows up. Yeah, well, we we sexualize wounds that we don't address. Okay. And so whatever it is, it comes out in the type of porn you watch. It comes out in the type of you know arousal st- structure or template that you have. And it's all connected to our wounds. It's all connected to our, you know, so let's say you have a distant father um, and then you have a mother who becomes smothering because she's not getting her needs met through her husband. So she goes to um, her son and the whole world revolves around the son, right? So Mm -hmm. it's kind of that similar what we were just talking about. Yeah. Um, And so how does his sexual template then begin to be formed? right? How does that, that selfishness, that wound of devouring, I would not be surprised if the type, you know, the type of porn that he begins to look at, um, you know, does involve older women or does involve, you know, all these, like, it's all connected. It's all connected, right? Mm -hmm. So we follow the story. We follow, um, you know, his sexual fantasies to then lead to his wounds. Because if we heal the deep wounds, then the acting out sexual behavior stops right we cut out the roots because it's it's always about the root wounds that we eroticize Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's a general overview i can go in more depth if you'd like no yeah i get that and then why and then you think i'm talking back to the beginning of the conversation and then you think men are resistant to heal those wounds because it feels foolish and they feel foolish sure well yeah and it reminds them of I mean, obviously we don't like pain. Who wants pain? Mm-hmm. Who wants to hurt? And then when you throw in the, uh, it's, you know, the toxic masculinity, it's not good to cry or it's not good to, it's just like, we have so many tears. We must weep. We have mm-hmm. so many tears. We got to cry um, rather than this kind of macho machismo stuff that is just so unhealthy. It's like, mm-hmm. no, we've got to weep for those little boys who were so hurt, who were so exploited who were sexually abused, who were traumatized, who were bullied. So many men I work with that have stories of being bullied. And then it comes out, it comes out sideways. It comes out in how we reenact our unprocessed traumas in our mm-hmm. marriages. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to ask a, a facetious question. Um, how many men have you seen change and go through that work because they're the wives or the women who love them just kept giving in to their their selfishness yeah they don't change when their wives continue to give in Um, yeah the the sad part so many men are so stubborn they actually so many of them don't come get help until their wives have literally said here's the hard fast boundary you know you're you've i'm kicking you know you're kicked out of the house you're until these hard boundaries are set so many times the men don't even start the work until those boundaries have been set because they realize they've been able to manipulate their women for so long, their wives for so long that they don't even trust. They don't even, they have such little view of women that they actually don't even believe what they say until they're literally, you know, in the basement of their parents' house, living with a bunch of cats or something. And then they're like, Oh geez, uh, maybe I should start doing something. And then it's another, at least a year of doing really hard and really quality therapy, people who understand the dynamics of abuse, um, you know. And, how, and that's a really important question because there's just such this idea of like general therapy, everything's fine. As long as you can find someone and get them to someone, it's nope. fine. Um, so what are some questions? And hold on, I wanna say this too. 
if I'm a woman, it's like, oh, good. OK, I just need to get my my husband to agree to go to the right person. Then that the, the right person is going to fix them and make it all OK, even if my husband's resistant. I, right. I want to hit both of those questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, again, it's super hard to find, you know, I mean, obviously, I'm a little partial t- towards our organization, Christian mm-hmm. Counseling Center um, for Sexual Health and Trauma. And check us out. Do you out. work with people just in your area, in Seattle area, or is it everywhere? Uh, we're, we have an East Coast site and a uh, uh-huh. West Coast site. And so we kind of go back and forth. And mm-hmm. so we do a lot of intensives. So people fly in um, and we do weekend intensives, marriage, individual intensives. We do groups um, for folks as well. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of different services, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, you got to ask, ask the right questions. Do they understand domestic violence? Do they understand power and control? Do they, cause so many therapists, they took maybe one class on domestic abuse and it's just like, wait a minute. And that's, okay, and, that's really, the masters. and yes. And people assume every therapist is a domestic abuse, abuse expert. Yep. There's right. that assumption right. that. And they're not. No, not at all. Yep, not at all. Yeah. And I was, you know, grateful that my ended up being my supervisor, but Dr. Nancy Murphy, I think she's one of the foremost leaders in domestic violence. She wrote, spoke to the UN, does, you know, she was able to mentor me for 10 years. And it's just like she runs uh, dvtraining.net and trains past okay. domestic violence. And so she's just a powerhouse. But it's like you got to find people who know the world, who know the work who understand the complexities of abuse because abuse flips everything on its head, right? Mm -hmm. Everything on its head. And so you have to have somebody that understands those dynamics because it's really, and then again, with churches, it's even harder. Yeah. Yeah. I think sticking out the words of power and control, like people using that language Mm -hmm. is always like catching things from you. Also a fair thing to say is what books have you read? Yeah, yeah. on this subject and people better be able to name five crazy easily right right, right, right. off the top of their heads without right. having to look it up and think <laughs> at yeah. least I mean, five seems so minimal but mm-hmm. uh you know just a quick but if you find a pastor who's read five books on this subject you're doing great yeah exactly exactly yeah and there's a lot of great resources um that I'm sure you have as well that people can yeah. find connection to folks that are trustworthy. Um, yeah. 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 Oh, that's great. So um, what would, a, what would language sound like if a man was really one could change? You were really hoping he was going to get into therapy. And then what, what, what are some cues and that you could listen for as a female? Yeah. I think trusting, you know, trusting your gut, right. And, and if you're doing your own work and your own, like, you won't fall into kind of that false sense of hope or that, mm-hmm. oh, maybe he really changed. Like, it's just going to be this slow, really non-sexy thing that's going to change over time. You're going to see that, yeah, he's becoming safe. I feel safe in his presence. I feel safe to, to rage at him. I feel mm-hmm. safe to weep with him. Um, mm-hmm. You know, stability. He has been sober from pornography for over a year as he's been continuing to go um, weekly to his therapy and as he's been going to groups and as I've been listening, you know, watching him download all these podcasts and it's just like over time you see a changed life. He responds in a different way. It's not quick. It's not sexy. It's slow, monotonous, and it can happen. But again, it's not flowers and whisking you away for the weekend and then it's fine. Actually, the, yeah, the opposite of that, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we but that's important to know because what a guy wants to do is, oh, well, he finally took me to the favorite concert that I've been wanting to go to forever. Gross. Him right. being nice so you don't leave is not the same thing as being him being less selfish. Exactly. Yep. No, he's just trying to win you over by manipulating you by buying you off. Mm. No, like I will not be prostituted. Like I yeah. honor myself. I love myself, and I'm mm. going to require a different way of engaging. And how does that connect with healthy sexuality? Mm -hmm. Well, who we are sexually is a reflection of who we are in the rest of our lives, right? Okay, yeah, okay. It's Uh a reflection. So if you live a secret sexuality, Mm -hmm. if you have a secret, uh, you know, porn addiction or something, you live a secret life, you're going to live secretly in other arenas of your life. Mm -hmm. You're, You're going to. Like who we are sexually is a reflection of who we are in the rest of our lives. And so it reflects, they, they mirror each other. They reflect each other. 
And so a lot of times as we're dealing, as I'm working with men to become sexually healthy, um, you know, we're dealing with <clears throat> what does it mean to, to be mature, to out, outgrow porn, um, to be step into humility rather than arrogance, to no longer live in fantasy, but to actually live in truth, step into reality, to be emotionally present instead of emotionally distant. Um, instead of that selfishness that we talked about, what does it mean to live in a mutuality, mm -hmm. right? To be patient with sex rather than demanding, um, to step into our strength rather than our insecurity. You know, these are just a few concepts that I talk about in my book, The Sexually Healthy Man. Um, but that's how, yeah, these men begin so to my, my favorite thing you said is using the word outgrow. Um, Gary Thomas in his book, When to Walk Away, he, he, have, he and I have played a podcast phone tag for about like, he has like we have something on the schedule and then he gets moved. We have something on the schedule and then he gets moved. But right. in his book, When to Walk Away, he talks about he used to consider Christianity that you were a Christian if you believed everyone was good and mm. like only saw the best in people. Sure. And he recognized that being mature as a Christian meant balancing grace and truth and practicing discernment. Yes. And I loved that. It's definitely like how I viewed my own life, but, but he, seeing that written was so lovely. And I love your language around outgrowing, you know, or, you know, it's time to outgrow pornography. It's time to outgrow right. raging as a, like right. a, like a 12 year old teen. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, you know, I'm really drawn to that language because I grew up in the purity culture. I grew up, yeah. grew up in the true love weights movement and, and it's such a shame based idea. And it's like, no, shaming people into sexual health is not helpful. <laughs> and yet I also want sexual health and I actually want to call mm -hmm. people to more. And so the language of outgrowing is talking about dealing with those childhood wounds so we can move beyond into more mature behavior. So we can engage in a healthy way. And I've obviously never been a man, but it also seems like a language that would align a bit because mm -hmm. no man wants to be called a boy. Sure, exactly. Right? So thinking in the terms of, okay, I just need to like outgrow a childish behavior. Right seems like it would land in a different way than just even changing yes. or you need to and, change. And exactly. And many men can own and they can tell within themselves when they're acting childish, when they're acting yeah. adolescent, you know, when you're arguing about this or when you're, it's like, no, do you see how you're like, can you begin to see yourself through that lens of when you're acting out of a scared little boy or when you're stepping into true authentic masculinity um, that is secure, that's rooted, that's that vulnerable, <laughs> that's mm -hmm. not violent. I'm going to, I'm going to think about my own coaching practices, you know, I mainly work with women, but that outgrow idea, I'm going to figure out, I'm going to, I, I have worked with a lot of teen boys, like a lot, and I did a positive behavior initiative for teen boys in school. So I like, ooh, that outgrow, like I, you, when you tell a teenage boy, you need to act like a man. Mm. They like change, like something in them goes, okay. And they like align to that. Right. And you um, can do that. Obviously you can do that in a shaming way, right? Yeah. It's time to man up or no, or you, no, can do it, yeah. right? you can do it in a way that actually is encouraging of just like, yes. we need healthy, strong men of integrity. Yes. And what does that mean for you to step into that? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to play around with that outgrow language in my own coaching too, but, but, but I love that. Um, okay. So I ask every guy who I have on the podcast, if someone is out there dating, where should they go to find a good, healthy guy? Ah, right. <laughs> well, they're, right there. Here's the thing. In every space, uh, what is it, the stats? 63% of um, something like that. 60%, 59, I don't know, something like that. Pastors use pornography. Something crazy. What? Right. So six, I think it's 63% of youth pastors and 59% pastors have some type of relationship with porn. 80% of Christian men. So it's like, no matter where you are, it, you're going to find good guys and bad guys guys who are going to consume you. I don't care where you're at. And so it doesn't necessarily matter the spaces, more of the questions, the, you know, first dates, like, are you going to be, find somebody who's real with their pain, real with their story, 
Are you going to find someone who's super polished? And it's like, I do not trust anybody who is, Hey, God is good all the time. It's just like, no, like, like, like no, we have to, to, to be an authentic Christian. You have to hold the death and the resurrection simultaneously. So you can never be too all resurrection. All God, like you have to hold them both. The resurrection is just as true as the crucifixion. And the crucifixion is just as true as the resurrection. And so find people who live honest lives, um, who mm -hmm. are not afraid of their own shame, their own pain. Um, and then you can begin to build a relationship. I heard something about the Jewish culture and it said their faith is based in asking the questions, mm -hmm. not always having the right answers. That's and good. that stuck with me so drastically deeply, you know, because it was like, oh, that felt exactly what you're saying. Um, and I really want to you to hear what he said, that there's no place you can go. There's no like app you can use right. to turn off the work of discernment or yeah. maturity or recognizing healthy people. Like there's, okay, well, I found him at church so I can turn that off. Right. Okay, he reads the Bible, so I don't have to worry about that. Right. Okay, I don't have to do the, my own work of discernment. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yep, exactly. Awesome. Andrew, I love this. Tell people, I know you've got all kinds of stuff out there. Uh, so yeah. tell people where they can find more about you. Yeah, yeah. So you can find us at christiancc.org, christiancc.org. And then um, got a popular blog you can find on andrewjbauman.com andrewjbauman.com and uh, you can follow my work there as well. Awesome. Okay. If you had one message to like send to the world, like it's mm -hmm. like your last minute on earth and you have one thing to say <laughs> that everyone needs to hear, what would it be? Oh, geez. Uh, yeah. That's a, it's a lot of pressure. Last, da, da, da. Last, moment, last moment on earth. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to end with this, um, Romans 2, 4, the kindness of God leads to repentance. Mm -hmm. May you have the courage to step into kindness towards yourself. Um, mm -hmm. Whether you are someone who's been abused, whether someone who, if you have been the abuser, will you begin to step into kindness? Kindness does not mean skirting away from truth or taking ownership of, but it truly means beginning to be tender to those, to those places within us that are so hurt, that need care, that need love. Um, that's the work of change is stepping into kindness that leads to repentance. Awesome. Well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, yep. Thank you for helping us on our journey to becoming toxic person proof. You guys check out Andrew and hit him up. Thank you.